Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar for the EU Open Data Competition, the EU Data 2020. Uh, my name is Ingmar Farfam. I'm working in the Publications Office, more concretely in the EU Open Data Portal. And here is my colleague, uh, Simon. <laughs> uh, so in this webinar, we're going to have different presenters. Here, if you can find it here, I'm going to present very briefly uh, EU Datatone for the future participants who may be interested. And then I'm going to give the floor to my colleagues. We're going to have the presentation from Eurostat for challenge one and challenge two. Later, it's going to be followed by uh, the Director General for Research and Innovation, following by Eurofound, European Patent Office, and then the Director General uh, Regional and Urban Policy. So I'm going to show you very briefly the website. So here you can see like more or less all the rules concerning the competition. So uh, this competition has been organized with the publications office in close collaboration with uh, the European Commission uh, Director General uh, for Regional and Urban Policy. This is fourth edition. And what it's looking for is like to promote uh, open data so the participants who can be on teams of up to four people are invited to develop applications that uh, have to com be complying with the four different challenges, as you can see here. And all these challenges are aligned to the European Commission uh, challenges. So you have the challenge one, my colleagues are going to present, that is the uh, our European Green Deal, challenge two, an economy that works for people, challenge three, a new push for European democracy, and challenge four, a Europe fit for the digital age. So you have like until the 3rd of May to submit your proposal and your ideas about what you would like to develop. And uh, then if you are shortlisted, if your team is shortlisted, uh, you will have the opportunity to present your application uh, on the 13th and 14th of October in the European Week of Regions and Cities in Brussels. And also you will attend the final competition that is on the 15th of October in Brussels. So, uh, as you may know already, uh, we have different prizes, like first place, second and third place in each challenge. And then uh, if you have any further questions afterwards, you feel free to contact us. We have here the functional mailbox. Oops, so it's here. So don't hesitate to ask us any question if you want to, would like to know more. So about the webinars, uh, the purpose of these webinars is to better understand the data because some of the rules of the competition, the rules of the competition uh, invite participants to use like open data that comes from uh, or different uh, partners. So in the rules of the competition, you will know more. So basically, uh, the different data providers here, they will present their data and see how you can potentially exploit it for, for the application. So you can also see the webinars because they will be recorded. They will appear here. I will show you very briefly. Okay. So here you have all the different uh, speakers and the different challenges they will present for uh, about and the time. And here you have the first one from last uh, week. So then um, I give the floor to my colleagues. So. Eurostat is going to start presenting for the first challenge and the second challenge, my colleagues uh, Mikey and Paul. So uh, I give you the floor and uh, I will be more if in case you have any further questions, uh, please you have there like a chat box so you can directly type there the questions you may have. And at the end of the presentation, I will ask uh, my colleagues the presentation uh, like the, the question, these questions. So, OK, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emma. This is uh, Mike Baumeister. Good afternoon to everyone. I will first make sure to share my screen. So I hope that that is visible now. No, again, it's moved. We can see it. Yes. Thank okay, you. good. Perfect. Thank you very much for the confirmation. Okay, so you can see the screen now. That's perfect. Um, just to briefly start over again, um, my name is uh, Maike. I work at Eurostat, the statistical office of the European. And this will be basically a live demonstration 
of the Eurostat website to show you the statistics available on the European Green Deal. So I'll just focus on challenge one only. My colleague Paul will take over for me later to present challenge two to you. I start my live demonstration to on the homepage. So this is the homepage of Eurostat. There are quite some big important messages now, these orange fields that normally aren't there, but uh, good, good that they're here for now, but not something to really pay a lot of attention to. Normally you would see the re new news releases like this. And what I would like to so tell you is that Eurostat publishes uh, statistics at the European level that enable comparison between countries and regions. And these statistics are available through an online and open database. So all our data is available on free public access. And we also have uh, several statistical publications uh, on and related to these data, including digital publications, wiki articles, and uh, more of these. But for the data tone, you need to link and use open data sets. And the Eurostat data set provides exactly that. So I would like to focus really on the data. And my aim for you is for today is to show you how to get the data first. And I really think this is a main selling point the automated data retrieval from the Eurostat database. And second, where to find the information and the data sets that you might want to use for the challenge number one, the European Green Deal. So to quickly start with the automatic data retrieval, because I just want to show you and, and point you the way, and that's, that's it and enough on the specific challenge. So I don't know what. So on the data, we have Let me see. Okay. For um, what I wanted to show, show you on the uh, on data, there is bulk download and web services. And these are the two main points to look at for the automatic data retrieval. Michael, so, could you please share your screen again? I think uh, we, we lost that one. Okay, thank you for notifying me. That's Okay. Let's try again. Very good. We're back. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. So I'll just go really back to the main page here. Show you what I want to focus on first is the data. Let's see. We get a drop down menu. Yes, here we are. So what? Well, Bulk download web services. So this is unfortunate because <laughs> normally the website um, behaves differently. So I'll just I'll just try and click now on what I will try to show. Otherwise, it will stay with database today. I'm here under data. Bulk download web services. Those are the two pages for the automatic data retrieval. Um, this is where I was uh, stuck when I think I lost the screen. So these two are the main pages to to have a look at where you can automatically retrieve data in, in large quantity. It's very important for something like uh, an application that where you would want to uh, download more data. Um, web services, there are also uh, links to SDMX and JSON. So this these are the two ones to really look at when you're more advanced in, in developing the app. And to first look and realize, okay, which data would I would like to use from the data, you would go to the database. Because you know, you need to know what you want to download. What is there to download? What will the app be about? Uh, you want to search for specific data, but you also want to maybe browse and look around, discover opportunities and brainstorm on applications. And for that, I quickly just wanted to go back to the, to the European Green Deal, just to 
quickly show uh, the main topics that we're looking at for the Green Deal is climate change, it's affordable, secure energy, circular economy, resource efficiency, we have uh, environmental protection, ecosystem biodiversity, uh, farm to fork strategy and transportation smart uh, and sustainable mobility. So these are basically the topics that are all relevant for the European Green Deal. And then with that in the back of your mind, you can have a look at the database. So this is really like at the core of things where you would find the relevant information. So we had uh, climate neutral, protecting environment, for example, resource efficient. Where would you go? Simply here, you can browse around and see and find different topics. For example, environment and energy is available here in the database, but we also have tables on EU policy, which include circular economy indicators, for example, where we have sustainable development indicators. So these are also relevant for the European Green Deal. And we have cross-cutting topics where there is a folder on climate change. Now, if I go back at the top for environment and energy, if you click on this, you can see drill down to more detailed levels where there are the actual data sets. So for emissions, for example, we have air emission inventories, the greenhouse gas emissions. So as soon as you see these icons, you've actually reached the data sets. Now, greenhouse gas emissions, of course, are very relevant for the European Green Deal. And here you can find more information in the sense that there is metadata. If you click on that icon, you will find more information about this, this specific data set with information about data description, for example. Now, uh, you can also have a look at the data itself. Um, one more important thing I would like to point out, which is really important here, is to take note of the data set code. So for this specific data set here, it's ENF Air GGE. And this is really your handle for data downloading. So this will come back in the bulk download and into in the, the web services, you would need to know this code. So once you've decided which data set you would like to use or multiple data sets, you would really need to pay attention to the data set code. Now we can have a quick look at the data set itself. If you click on the data explorer, it opens a window where you will see the table. Now this is always organized in a way where you have countries in the rows and time periods in the columns. And this is all, uh, this you can all modify. So you can rearrange and so change your selection. Rearranging is by simply dragging and dropping. And this gives you a different arrangement of the table. You can also click on the plus and this gives you the opportunity to make a different selection for what you want to have a look at, for example, you can say, okay, I only want to have a look at greenhouse gas emissions from energy, for example. So once you click that, then that, that is the specific numbers that you would have here. Now, there are possibilities also here at the top to take note of. Most important, again, a link to metadata, a link to download the data, and also useful a bookmark you can make to your specific selection. If you click on download, there are multiple possibilities again, but this is a really like a manual uh, way of downloading the data. You can download it to explore further in, for example, Excel. Um, if you really want to make it, use it in an app, I would again refer you to the, to the bulk download and the web services for automatic data retrieval. Now, this is the database. So this is quite, um, well, it's just a structure of a data tree and it doesn't give you a lot of uh, background. It doesn't give you much information, but what is here. So if you really would like to look more first at the themes and the information that is available, the other possibility is to start with browsing statistics by theme. And if you look at that page, that really gives you kind of a starting point to each of the main parts of your stat website. So you would find here really um, 
links to specific sections on sustainable development, again, uh, relevant for the European Green Deal. Uh, when you get really on a section of the database, of the data, uh, sorry, of the website, that shows you more on sustainable development goals. And each of the links on the previous site kind of links to a page like this. And all of these landing pages have more or less the same layout. There's an introduction, there are highlights on this specific topic, and you have find direct access to, again, um, indicators by goals and tables, but also publications. So this really allows you to, to, to look in more detail at a specific topic, find the related publications, find wiki articles that are written on this topic. So this gives you a lot more context on a specific on a specific topic. But again, to know what is actually available in terms of data, the way would be to go back to, to tables. Now, of course, sustainable development goals is not the only section that we have. There's one for circular social, much more on the circular economy, uh, also with different visualizations here, left-hand side. You can click off these icons to find and, and get to these um, these different highlights. And again, on the right-hand side, tables, publications. So this is all basically organized in the same manner. Um, we also have, if we go down here, it's more than the traditional statistical domains, environment and energy, environment is relevant. Climate change is very relevant, um, as I said, so we can have a quick look at that page as well. So here you can see each of these, if you click, if you go back to the data, to the browse statistics by theme, you kind of go to the same starting point from which you can find more information. Um, for climate change, again, we have a visualization. I'll quickly show. So this page on climate change is more like a, a portal that brings together really different um, data sets from uh, across many domains at Eurostat, but really with a few of climate change uh, in mind. And so this visualization, for example, shows you the greenhouse gas emissions. And here you can click through to some other. So just to get a bit of a feel for the data. Uh, of course, you can download the data yourself, make a graph, but this gives you a first quick picture of what is there, what is the trend. And you can up here select countries to compare if you would like to do so. So this way you can see the data for these three countries at the same time. So this, this is a nice tool to just get a quick quick feel for, for some of the data. And, and these type of visualization tools are available across domains. But again, the European Green Deal has a, a lot of different, it's hard to go into details at the moment. Um, the most important one that I want to say is, okay, for European Green Deal, most important is, is climate neutral. So we have the climate change website here where you would find more information, um, where you would find also a link to the database. That's the last thing I'll quickly show. There is, when you go to these pages, as I said, if you go into direct access to and you click on database, you again get like a data navigation tree, but just a small part. So it allows you to really focus on that part of the database that is relevant relevant for this topic. So at Eurostat, we have a lot of different data that is relevant for the European Green Deal. As I said, sustainable development, circular economy, among others. There's also health, for example, because the European Green Deal is about well-being of people. Um, forestry, agriculture, so farm to fork strategy information would be found there, environment, energy, climate change. There's a lot of information. Um, I'd like to conclude my tour uh, with this. And I would like to just hope that I conveyed that uh, there's really a lot of information. And I'd like to invite you to browse around yourself, have a look at the different sections. Uh, there's a lot of detail to discover. Um, browsing around helps you to really get a feel for what is there. And then with the use of the ID or the, the data set code that I showed you, you can really go and retrieve the data you need. 
And um, I'm happy to, to answer questions, but we've agreed that we would do this after the presentation of my colleague, uh, Paul. So I'd like to, to give the floor to him now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mikey. Yep. Thank you, Maike. So my name is, is Paul. Now it's my time to turn to share my screen with you. See my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I work uh, in the Macroeconomic Statistics Directorate of, of Eurostat, and my my pleasure to also to show you some of the uh, the data that we uh, that we that we produce um, for everybody to to reuse and to analyze on uh, on the economy in particular, and uh, also a little bit. Uh, on, on the social aspects of it, because the team is called Economy That Works for People. Maike showed you already uh, some key aspects of our website and where to find data. Uh, I will show you uh, more specifically uh, data on uh, gross domestic products, GDP, on a government deficit, uh, on inflation, and on unemployment. Uh, these are four, what I think are key indicators that are used uh, for economic policy making. Of course, there are many more data, but these are uh, very well used indicators. Um, like Maike, I will focus on uh, the data browser here, the data tree. But uh, I'd just like to emphasize, as Maike did, that um, if you're more interested in automatic downloads, the bulk download services are for you. My, my purpose here is to really show you what kind of data, uh, where maybe also which, which part of the data tree you can find the kind of data uh, that you're looking for, uh, so for you to, to, uh, to, to use. Um, so we go first also this uh, page that Michael also showed, which shows you a little bit the, the breakdown of statistics that we, that we produce. Uh, Michael looked at the environment and climate issues and so on, uh, where I will focus on economy and finance and also uh, population and social conditions. Economy and finance contains all economic, macroeconomic data. Uh, and these are the various different sub themes of this uh, area. Population and social conditions contains also many, many different uh, areas. And I will uh, look there specifically at, at um, so, as Micah showed, you can go to the database directly by clicking here. There are uh, there's different uh, subparts of this uh, um, subparts of this uh, database. Because here, the database by themes that will really go into the into the database and the details uh, and all the data that we produce are there. There's also tables by teams, which are more of a selection of indicators that um, are uh, uh, selected already uh, and also can easily be visualized. I will show you that at the end. I will start with uh, now with economy and finance. This is the same teams that we saw on the first screen. Economy and finance, you can recognize again. Um, different uh, subfolders. National accounts is the main folder. National accounts are the uh, main set of indicators on the economy. It's a coherent set of, uh, of national account of, of economic variables in which we find, for example, uh, gross domestic product and others. Um, national accounts itself is broken down again in different components like annual national accounts and quarterly national accounts and, and some others. Uh, I will focus on annual data here, and here we have main GDP aggregates, and main means uh, all the, the, the big variables, the, the most important variables that we that we derive from the national accounts. 
And here we uh, reach the, the bottom end of this um, of this of this tree with the three different uh, tables or data sets underneath. When it says updated at the end, it means that fresh data have been loaded uh, today. Um, and you can do a uh, download by uh, by this uh, zip button, but you can also click on the data explorer to uh, analyze the data on screen and potentially to download the data that you need. So here is the table directly. I clicked on GDP and main components, and here's immediately the table that we were looking for. Gross domestic product at market prices. You can see here in the top, the national accounts indicator that we chose was GDP at market prices. Um, and in unit of measure is current prices, millions of euros. So here you have immediately the data on the total value of GDP uh, in uh, each of the European countries and some others as well. Um, including also the aggregates. It's one of the main tasks of Eurostat is also to, to produce the statistics for the European Union and for the Euro area. Well, um, there's a lot to, to customize. Heike also already um, highlighted. For example, you can different, select different indicators. If I click on button here, change the selection, then you will find um, long list of variables. This, these are only the main aggregates from the national accounts. There's much more detail to be found elsewhere. But let's have a look, for example, at another important indicator, which is final consumption expenditure of households. Let's select that one instead of GDP. Um, and we can also look at, uh, at, for example, the different units of measures that, uh, that, uh, that are offered. So um, there are many already selected here, pre-selected. Uh, an interesting one, if I just deselect all this, would be, for example, percentage of GDP. So now we're looking at household final consumption expenditure as percentage of GDP. Click on update, it will then select these numbers. and uh, You'll find them on the screen or for ready for download or exploration. A nice uh, feature, uh, also worth mentioning, is that there are sort buttons here. You click here, data are sorted by the columns that you click on. So it gives you immediately an indication. Uh, we see here countries from, uh, from Western Balkan having the highest shares of household consumption expenditure in GDP. Whereas if we go to the bottom, we see countries like Luxembourg, Ireland, Norway, Malta having lower uh, shares, which is in line with uh, economic uh, theory. Okay. This is annual GDP. Effectively, uh, when we release data uh, on GDP, it's usually uh, quarterly data. Our growth rates, the, the, the GDP growth rates that we um, publish on quarterly data, I will not show that to you, but you can find that in, here in the main GDP aggregates of quarterly national accounts, right there, the most recent economic growth rates. Um, Maybe a reminder as well, Mike mentioned it already, but when you want to download this, this uh, numbers more in bulk format, it's very useful to find first the codes of the data sets that you want to download. Let's look at something else. Another very important uh, indicator for users is the government deficit. You will be aware of the so-called Maastricht criteria that, that specify that member states should not have government deficit that is higher than 3% of GDP. And if you're interested in those data, you can find them here under government statistics. Go down to government finance statistics, uh, deficit and debt. The government deficit data set immediately. Um, you will find the percentages that we are looking for. Click again on the sort button, the latest data for 2018. Uh, you will find that Luxembourg is the country with the highest um, uh, government uh, surplus, whereas uh, 
Cyprus, Romania, France, Spain have the highest government deficits in this year. Also of interest for the Maastricht criteria are the debt data. Sorry, that's in the same data set here. I just have to find another variable in the gross, consolidated gross debt. Select that one as well. Here, my variable, you see here the percentages that are relevant also for the master criteria. It specifies that debt should not be higher than 60% of GDP. Just one last example of, a date of an important indicator for the users for policy making. This is inflation. And this you find under the prices domain where you find the harmonized index of consumer prices, which is the official inflation measure of the European Union, and which is used by the ECB for monetary policy making. So interest policy is based on these numbers. And the headline indicator uh, for of the HICP is the annual rate of change on a monthly basis. We're comparing prices of the last month with the same month previous year, so it's annual rate, but monthly calculated. Click here again, you'll see uh, the latest data for the total inflation measure. Last month that we have data for the, Euro for the Euro area countries is February, uh, for all the countries is uh, January. So find the European Union and your Euro, Euro area inflation numbers and then Highest inflation is currently noted, if you want to know, in Hungary and Romania. Uh, this is the total inflation measure. If you go on selection again, you can see there is a large number of subcomponents of the, of the inflation as well. You can get inflation for food or, or for other uh, interesting products. For the last indicator that I wanted to show you, which is unemployment, I will not use the database, but I want to show you something else, namely the tables by themes. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, the pre-selection of, of key indicators, which are then easier to uh, also to uh, select and to visualize. I should now not go to economy and finance, but to the next branch, population and social conditions, where you find data on the labor market here the labor market and i was interested in unemployment numbers so they are found here they are the result of the so-called labor force survey main indicators are here including unemployment let me select the total unemployment rate and there's an extra button here you see the data browser the tool that we are, are developing it's still in beta as you can see uh, but it's maybe worth mentioning it because it's a nice visualization tool of uh, ski tables. So here you find the, the, the data table again in the same format with countries in the rows and years in the columns. But then there are different options here to immediately create a, a line chart or a bar chart or a map. So a line chart is found here. This uh, shows by default then the unemployment rate of the European Union and the Euro area. But you can select by clicking here also other countries, want Belgium or Greece, for example. And you see the big differences in uh, developments across the countries. And there's also then the option to make bar charts, which look like this, are different ways of present as well. If you can range the views there. Um, so we have a bar chart per year in this case, or indeed, this is always nice and attractive, a map of employment data. I will select 2018 for which all countries have data. Out a bit, you can see the entire European Union and the darker the color, the higher the unemployment 
rate. See the disparities in Europe, nice visually. Well, I think that is uh, what I what, uh, would like to cover, uh, some key indicators on the economy, an economy that works for people, as the team says. Um, I hope it is helpful for your work. Uh, as Mike said, also, I'm willing very much to answer any questions if I can. So, looking forward to that. Now, I'll give the floor back to colleagues from the publication office. Uh, thank, thank you, Paul. Um, one question would be, uh, how is the availability of the data? So can we find data for all member states, for all the different categories? Um, in principle, uh, yes, for all these, these uh, the indicators that I showed, certainly. All the key indicators, uh, the main data sets have uh, data for all the European uh, member states, uh, but also EFTA countries and, uh, and to a large extent also candidate countries. Uh, in some cases, also non-European countries are included, like US and Japan, just for, for comparison. Um, of course, there are other data sets where maybe uh, completeness is somewhat less, but on the whole, we try uh, uh, most of the statistics that we produce is based on, on, uh, on, uh, on regulations that oblige all the countries to produce these data in a comparable way. Okay. Uh, Maria, do you want to ask a question? Oh, um... It was about the um, um, the the data that uh, Maike showed us before. She you also shared some visualizations. Uh, is the raw data behind it also available? I mean, once somebody browses through vis the visualization, can they access the data behind? Uh, Maike, are you answering that or? This is this is certainly the case. Um, so for the visualization I showed, I don't know if it would take too much time, but um, for these visualizations we show, usually directly below, there are links to the data sets. Okay. So there you would find directly the different data sets where you can download. And in, in, in uh, basically it comes down to all the data that we publish, that we have in our publications or um, elsewhere in visualizations, we indicate again by using the data set code where the data comes from. So uh, you should be able to always find back the, uh, the, the, the data set itself as a, a downloadable file in whatever format you would prefer. Uh, and another question I wanted to, to, to ask, uh, when, you, when we are in the table view, we see that you can um, select some variables and parameters but uh, what if we want to have access to the full set of data? Would then we would uh, need to go to the bulk download? Um, if I may answer that one, uh, maybe uh, if you look into, yeah, I don't have the screen shared anymore, but in the data tree, over every data set, there is, um, there is two buttons. One is for the data explorer to go into the, into the viewer that we have just demonstrated. The second one was uh, uh, labeled a zip file. And in this zip file is, is basically a download of the entire data set. So there you would, uh, I think, would answer your question. Thank and you. download every data set in one go. And I can, I can just quickly add to that also when you see, when you're in the data browser, where you see the table at the right, right, uh, right hand top corner, where there's the download button, if you click on that, there are different options and there would also be one that says uh, download the full data set. Perfect. So thank you very much for um, for your presentation. So if you have a further question, you can, of course, contact us directly to the functional mailbox. So we also encourage you again, like to the participants who or potential participants to uh, write your questions and later we can just go back to them or ask the, the speakers. So, okay, now he's presenting uh, Pavel from uh, Directorate in General for Research and Innovation. So, Pavel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello. I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Hopefully it will work. Yes, yeah, working. Thanks. Okay, good. So, hello again. Uh, I will present you the data about the... About the EU RNI funding. So, how the EU is uh, is funding the research and innovation? It is now mostly done through the through the Horizon 2020 program. 
this this program is is managed by the multiple multiple DGs, and uh, here in the DG RNI, we are uh, uh, in the common implement implementation center. We administrate uh, the the implementation of the program. So. Horizon 2020 is the biggest EU research generation program. It has almost the, the budget of 80 billion euro. So this 80 billion euro will be spread across seven years. So right now with 2020, we are entering the last year of the program. Uh, speaking of the data is that we are now talking about the data tone. So, uh, and for both of the challenges, the challenge one and challenge two, the, the core of this uh, Horizon 2020 EU research project is a, is a mandatory data set. So I will now present you what the data set contains. There is a slight uh, difference comparing what my colleagues from Europe are presenting, because they were mostly presenting the, the macro data aggregated on the country level. This data set is rather micro data. So uh, you, I will guide you through the, the structure and what is the linkage of the of the individual data in this data set. So I'm talking about the CORDIS EU research projects. You can find it on EU Open Data Portal. The, there is the link, link below here, but also you can just search uh, Google for CORDIS EU Open Data Portal and you will find it. Uh, on the EU Open Data Portal, you can find uh, the files in the multiple formats, mostly as a CSV file or Excel files. So you can download it and uh, files by yourself. And let me guide you. So let's define the scope of the data. So as I mentioned, it's rather micro data. So we have the data about 27,000 projects, which were currently funded through the Horizon 2020. These 27,000 projects has about 130,000 participants. These participants represents about 35,000 unique organization, meaning organization participate multiple times. At this moment, we have about 100,000 scientific publications and about 60,000 uh, deliverables. So I will guide you through the terms and let me start with the overview. What is the interconnection between these, these elements, which I just mentioned? The core element is the project. So this is the, the project uh, which has a research aim. The project has an organization. There, there, in the individual files, you will, you will see there is a link. This link is mostly through the project ID. Uh, and for certain elements, the organization has also researchers. Uh, we identify the organization through the big. Babel, we cannot hear you. Hello, Pavel. The project should deliver. There is again link to the project through the project ID. We have uh, also a report. So the, the deliverable is what the project aims to do. The reports reporting on the progress in terms of achieving the, the deliverables and the overall aim of the project. We have the scientific publications. So this is the list of the publications which are related to the project. Let me go more in terms of uh, details a bit, bit deeper. So you will, when you download the files, you will see what kind of information you have there. So in terms of projects, each project has a, has a project ID. So this is the unique identifier. The project has an acronym title and abstract. The abstract define what the project is about. So it, it, it's a multiple paragraph text describing the, what the project should do. The status defines if the project were signed, terminated or closed. Then we have the topic classification. These are the topics related to Horizon 2020. So there are structure reference for other reference table, which defines what 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 the topic codes mean so we have the topics which and which funding schemes inside of the horizon 2020 as is rather big program there are multiple schemes and multiple topics you will find informations about the dates meaning when the project starts and project ends and obviously the amount so what is the requested amount 
from the from the EU for the project. Then we have organizations. So these are the organizations participating in the project. There is uh, the, the link to the project table. So it's defined uh, which organizations are linked to the project. So the project ID. Then there we have the unique organization ID, which is in our terminology called PIC. So there is a common uh, common repository of the organization participating in centrally managed uh, projects. So this PIC number is shared, for example, also with Erasmus uh, Plus or, or other centrally managed uh, schemes. The organization, the short name, you will find which type of the organization is, is it, if it's a research institutions, university, uh, public company. What is the address? What is the country? So we can identify the, the, the organization on the map. And what is the amount? So what is the EU contribution to the participants in the particular project? Then uh, I mentioned the deliverables. So these deliverables are part of the project. So obviously there is a, there is a link Link to the project, defining what what title of the of the deliverable it is, descriptions of the deliverable, what should be delivered in this type of the deliverable, but also link to the PDF document where you can read the full full text of the deliverable uh, on your computer. Reports uh, they 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 are similar structure as the deliverables, link to the. We have the title of the of the report. Uh, it's they are identified as a, as a public periodic reporting. So this is the reporting at certain period of time. It's each project might have a multiple periodic report. So it would be separated by the number. There is a there is a teaser. There is a summary report, description of the work performed, and uh, final results achieved within the period of the report. And lastly, publications. These are the, the three elements of the, of the projects I mentioned. So in terms of scientific publications, we have, uh, we have the title of the publication. We have the link to the project. So identify which projects this publication belongs to. We have the name of the authors, the, the, the name of the journal where the publication was, was published. The, the pages define the range of the of the pages where the publication was published in the journal. DO the, is the digital object identifier of the publication. This is sort of unique uh, identifier and is also uh, used in to query additional additional external service. So with the DO or DOI, you can query Crossref or Scopus publication databases to identify more information about the publication if you are interested. ISSN defines the the identification of the of the publisher and then we have also published year so the year when the publication was published yeah it was not last so this, this is the last one so this relates to the researchers which are linked to the to the organizations we have uh, two schemes in in the horizon 2020 where we gather information about the researchers this would be european research council and the marie kiros uh, fellow fellowships so there are two files both are the same structure we, we define what id the link to the to the project database organization id link to the organization table and uh, the the title of the of of the researcher and first and last name i mentioned that uh, that topics and uh, in other programs or organization types has a certain certain taxonomy so there is a there is a reference data which describes the 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 descriptions of the of the topics you can also find the the, the programs of the horizon 2020 also in other languages in these tables so this would be additional additional tables related to the cordis uh, data set and if that amount of data would not be enough for you, there is uh, additional data sources which you can use to query. And in this context, it would be the portal. The funding, funding and tenders portal is, is, the, is, the, is the place through which the applications for the, for the grants and also the management of the grants is, is managed through. 
So this is the this is the single platform through the our beneficiaries are managing their scientific projects. And this just to also give you option of certain additional APIs. So if you would like to dis discover more about certain topics, certain informations about the organizations or define more informations about the Horizon 2020, there are APIs which you can query with the with the IDs and the references you find in the, in the Cordis datasets and this API can give you further information. To not talk only about the data, we also have a visualization platform, which is called Horizon Dashboard, where you can find how this data can be visualized. So there is there is a link. I can also open it and to, to show you, but I don't want to have the presentations about the Horizon Dashboard. It's rather about the data. So you, if you if you zoom through it, you will you will see there are multiple multiple individual options to. Let me go through it. So we have uh, multiple individual dashboards which doing visualization of the data which are available at the, at the Cortex. So for example, the Horizon 2020 projects would be the one covering the, 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 the projects available. So you can find the information, the number of projects, number of participations, the EU amount, visualization on the map, list of the main organizations. Here it's sorted from the highest amount and you can discover further information about uh, about projects so you can find application and certain type of visualization which might inspire all these visualizations are also you can discover the data behind if you click view data or export you are able to export the data in the in this in the csv format and i think i'm at the end of the presentation okay. Uh, Pavel, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first, uh, the first of them is that uh, you are presenting for Challenge One, that is the European Green Deal, and Challenge Two, an economy that works for people. So, with these uh, data sets that you've been presenting, how do you think we can like answer to these challenges? <laughs> well, I think it's a challenging, challenging uh, <laughs> approach. So. For for the first first part for the green deal, we have a certain projects in the in the domain of the energy and renewable sources. So it would be on the on the participants to identify which which of the topics are related to the the, the renewable energy and maybe analyze the the results of the projects. So we have the publications. So analysis of the publication could be maybe interesting. So this would be for the first challenge for the second challenge there is the link to the region so we have for all the participants we have information about the address and the country so this this information can be used to 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 define the regions and and make certain regional analysis on this data okay thank you Pavel, uh, another question was, um, how, can you give people maybe a bit of tips how to work with such a big data set? Because I can imagine to work with 35,000 uh, lines might be a bit tricky for, for, for persons. Yeah, well, you can use, you can use Excel. The Excel uh, handles it. It's, mm, it, well, the, I think I would start with exploring not the full data sets because they are m multiple, multi megabyte size and will slow down your computer. So I will work with the subset. So maybe let's say 1000 projects or 100 projects to, to, to touch the data. And then when I validate my methodology or validate the, the, the process of uh, use, using the data, scale it up for the, for the large data sets. Or you can also use a uh, visualization tool like we are, for example, using for the dashboard, which is the ClickSense. You can install it for free on your computer. And then there you have options to load the data into, into the Click applications and make visualization there as well. Perfect. OK, thank you. So um, thank you very much, Pavel, again. Uh, now it goes John, John Hurley from uh, Eurofund, who is going to present for the Challenge 2, an economy that works for people. So, Jon, the floor is yours. 
give us a second that we give you. Okay, now. Hello? You should be able to hear me now, no? Yes, yes, yes perfect. Okay, great. I'm going to try and share my information now. There's a few technical steps to get through here. Um, my name is John Hurley from the European Foundation in Dublin. Uh, we are an EU agency. Um, and uh, we're a tripartite EU agency uh, providing research and knowledge to assist in the development of social and employment and work-related policies at a uh, European and national level. Um, can you see my uh, the, the first slide of my presentation? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Very good. So just to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to present in the next 15 minutes, uh, it's um, from a project we call the European Jobs Monitor. Um, in particular, it's uh, information on 130 European regions in nine of the larger member states, um, covering the period 2002 to 2017. And specifically what we've done uh, in, this, um, in this project is we've looked at shifts in the employment structure, and I'll explain a little bit by what I mean by that in a second. Uh, we looked at shifts in, in the employment structure in these 130 regions. Uh, using an approach we call the jobs approach, uh, which is uh, we've used in the European Jobs Monitor for over a decade now. Um, the data visualization I'm going to show you uh, is on our website. Um, the reference to the report, which uh, basically the data hangs out of, is called Ships in the Employment Structure at Regional Level. Um, and it's a joint report uh, of Eurofound and the European Commission Joint Research Centre. Uh, it was published in October last year. So a little bit of, uh, about the European, very briefly, uh, the European Jobs Monitor uh, applies the, the jobs approach to look at structural shifts in employment. Um, and it describes and analyzes shifts in the employment structure in terms of a unit of observation, which is the job. And the job is a given occupation, like an accountant or a teacher in a given sector, um, uh, let's say auto manufacturing or education. Uh, so we split employment in all of the member states up into a matrix of cells of occupation by sector cells. We rank jobs described in this way in terms of their mean hourly wage. Um, and then we assign them to, in this project, uh, we assign them to three tercels. Jobs which are well-paid, the top tercile of employment, mid-paid jobs, the, mid, uh, the middle tercile, and low-paid jobs. Um, and what we're, what we're doing in this particular data visualization is we're comparing regions against an implied average job structure at EU level. So we're trying to see if London region has a preponderance of uh, well-paid jobs uh, or of low-paid jobs vis-a-vis -vis the EU, uh, the EU uh, average. London's probably not a good uh, reference, of course, but uh, it does happen. The UK does happen to be one of the countries we cover in this uh, particular project. Um, it's all based on an It's all based on uh, existing Eurostat data, the EU Labour Force Survey and the EU Structure of Earnings Survey. Just to say that uh, the analysis is uh, of the jobs monitor is generally at member state and aggregate EU level. Uh, we've been doing it since two thousand and eight, and we've been covering developments in EU member states going back to the mid nineteen nineties. Um, in this particular project, we've looked at the data at a regional level. Um, so just very shortly to recap, uh, to recap the methodology, we uh, combine occupations and sectors into things we call jobs. Um, we rank those jobs in terms of mean wage. We assign them to tercels of uh, in the um, uh, so high paid, mid paid and low paid jobs. Um, and we do that based on an, a weighted EU average rank, job wage ranking. And then we look at the different types of regions uh, at NUTS 1 and NUTS 2 level, uh, and we see whether those regions have a preponderance of uh, high, low paid, mid paid or high paid employment. And we look at how that's developed over the period 2002 to 2017. So the, one of the standout findings of the report is that capital regions tend to have a preponderance of uh, high paid jobs, um, tend to have a, a polarized employment structure, um, and that that situation seems to have exacerbated uh, over the period uh, that we observe from 2002 to 2017. Now I'm going to show you the data visualization, hopefully. Um, so I will go back to here. Let 
I don't know if you can see this. Do I have to share this? Yeah. Yes, it's, it's working. The... Thank you. Perfect. So on our website, um, uh, instead of summarizing by types of regions, we actually look at the regions themselves in these scatter plots. And just to explain what the scatter plots show, uh, it shows that each of the dots is one of these 130 regions. Uh, the x-axis is the share of employment in low-paid jobs uh, in, in, in compared to the average in the, in the nine EU member states. On the vertical axis, we're looking at the share of employment in high-paid jobs, uh, again, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EU average. So you have four quadrants of, uh, of, of employment, uh, four uh, quadrants of employment structure. The, those in the top left quadrant are effectively have less badly paid jobs, uh, less paid jobs compared to the EU average and more employment in well paid jobs. Those in the, uh, the bottom quadrant here have uh, more, more jobs, more employment in low paid jobs and less employment in high paid jobs. Um, just to say that um, we are also capturing the, the mid paid jobs by implication. Um, any of the regions that fall into this sector here, into this quadrant, have uh, uh, less uh, employment in uh, less employment in high-paid jobs and less employment in low-paid jobs. By implication, they have a, a greater share of employment in in mid-paid uh, mid-paid jobs. So, just to say what uh, you know, what some of the principal findings. Uh, all of the dots are coloured. Uh, the colours uh, represent uh, regions of particular countries. So the purple, uh, the purples are Spanish uh, regions. Um, the brown are regions. Uh, the, uh, light blue are the Czech regions, uh, and uh, Greek, uh, dark green are Swedish. Uh, light green are um, uh, Belgian. Nine countries covered in total. Let me just show you the, the, the full nine. There they are. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the actual findings uh, for 2017. Uh, just to say that each of the capital regions are distinguished by, are actually marked by the, uh, the country, cap, uh, the country uh, codes. So they are uh, separately, uh, if you like, separately identified in the scatter plot. Um, one of the crucial findings of this research was that basically there's a, a prevalence of high paid employment in capital cities. Uh, they tend to have more, uh, a higher share of uh, employment in high paid jobs and a lower share of employment in low paid jobs. That's why they're to, in this particular quadrant. Uh, the only capital for which this is not, but even Italy, if we just, uh, if, we do a, a, if we do a selection, we'll see that Italy compared to the rest of uh, the Italian regions is comparatively uh, to the to the left uh, and and higher. In other words, it has more uh, employment in high paid jobs vis-a-vis um, -vis the other Italian regions. Um, we covered two periods. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you what the what the what the what it looked like in 2002. So there has been some change, but basically uh, the most of the dots end up either in the upgraded or in the the downgraded uh, uh, quadrants. And um, there's a lot of information here. So uh, obviously uh, it might help to actually just uh, concentrate on a smaller number of, uh, a smaller number of, uh, of regions. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to look first of all at uh, capital regions alone. Um, as I said, the first thing you notice about the capital regions is that basically they're very, uh, most of them are in this quadrant. Uh, the exception is Poland. This is for 2002. Let's look at how they move over the period 2002 to 2017. Well, this is quite interesting. Uh, the Polish, uh, the region in which Warsaw exists, uh, Mazowiecki, um, goes from being in almost in the bottom quadrant uh, to being, uh, it upgrades very significantly vis-a-vis -vis the EU average. Uh, it tends to have uh, improved its situation in terms of uh, its share of high paid employment. And it's also uh, got a much uh, uh, a much contracted share of low paid employment. Um, most of the other capital regions are are moving in this direction. They're actually very. They have a high share of high paid employment, but they're uh, they're also actually um, increasing their share of low paid employment as well. So there's a, some element of employment polarization going on in the capital cities. 
So yeah, there are three times in the two, 2017, uh, and uh, a graph which shows the movement between the two uh, for any regions that you, that you care to choose. Um, you can also scale the dots in terms of the employment size of the specific region. And so you hear, you see here that uh, the London region and Ile de France in France uh, are comparatively much more populous in terms of uh, employment compared to the other uh, capital cities. Just to say that also, if you click on any individual region, you can, you can pull up some, uh, some associated data uh, at the bottom of the page. So if we look at the, uh, Ile de France, for example, you just scroll to the bottom of the page, you see a table of uh, supplementary data which covers uh, some of the data which is included in the scatter plot, the share of employment and low paid and high paid employment, but also the actual employment uh, uh, in, in thousands in the two, uh, in, at the two, uh, in the two years, the share of white collar employment, the share of, into, uh, uh, of manufacturing employment, the share of services employment, um, the graduate share of employment, so the, the share of employment in, uh, in grad, uh, held by uh, those with third level qualifications. So you can do that by clicking on any of the individual points. The last thing I'll show you is just uh, a selection, just to show you something interesting at the national level using the data. If we, if we go into the choose regions and we select instead two countries, uh, we can see how uh, employment has changed in very different ways, uh, the employment structure in Italy and Poland. Italy and Poland in 2002. Oh, sorry, I've left the capitals in there. I'll just uh, eliminate them. Excuse me. Uh, and I'll go again. So Italy and Poland started off with Poland very heavily represented in this uh, in this uh, sector. L less a uh, lower share of high paid employment. Um, very much greater share of low paid employment, perhaps not surprisingly in 2002. Uh, the one difference, uh, the, the one just, uh, exception to that rule was Slaski, which is the industrial area in Silesia in southern Poland, uh, where there was, relatively speaking, a lower share of low paid employment. So this is a, a manufacturing sector with a lot of employment in, uh, in relatively well paid jobs, actually. Um, in Italy, you, you also have a, a gathering of the spots here. Um, uh, in the uh, in the lower quadrant, but uh, with really very very close to the EU average, much closer to the EU average than these Polish regions. But if we look at what's happened uh, in the period two thousand and two to two thousand and seventeen, you see a, a remarkable improvement in Poland in terms of the share of high paid employment. Most of the Italian regions have stayed more or less where they are, um, and uh, you can look at that in terms of change as well. You can see that for all regions, and Malopolsky, uh, Pomorsky, there's a really rapid improvement in the uh, the overall aggregate shape of uh, employment policy, whereas in Italy it stayed more or less the same. So I'd encourage you to look at the data in uh, yourself. Uh, as I said, it's really a data annex to a report. Uh, the report is on the. But we think the data visualization is very good as well because it, it captures uh, in some detail uh, quite a lot of information uh, in, in uh, you know, basically in one interactive uh, small uh, website. So I'd encourage uh, all of the users to have a look at it. I'm happy to answer any questions about the data um, uh, that you may have. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, John, for your presentation. We have actually two questions uh, from uh, one uh, from someone during the webinar. So the first one is uh, one question about the European Jobs Monitor. Is the EU average and the local salaries calculated uh, as calculated as PPP? Um, well, uh, the job wage ranking that we use to assign the jobs to tercels is basically a weighted job wage ranking uh, across all of the, the nine member states that we cover. So uh, in other words, uh, we, we look at the German wage ranking, we look at the French job wage ranking, uh, and when we make an, a weight, an employment weighted average of the, uh, of the wage, the standardized wage levels in each of those nine countries to generate our EU job wage ranking. And so what we're showing is how individual regions deviate in terms of their share of good, well-paid employment and low-paid employment from that EU average. So the EU, by, by implication, the EU average has 33% of employment in 
uh, in each of the three terraciles. Um, but each of the regions, each of the EU regions, deviates in the ways that we're actually illustrating here from that, uh, that average, uh, average share. Great, thank you. And another question is, uh, are the data powering the report accessible? The data are accessible. Uh, as I said, first of all, this is based on an, an application, uh, uh, you know, effectively uh, processing of existing EU data, which is the European Labour Force Survey uh, data for employment and the structure of earnings survey in order to generate these job wage rankings I've discussed. Um, so th that is the uh, the raw data underlying all of this uh, this analysis, but uh, the actual data for each of the 130 regions is available here uh, as an Excel sheet uh, download on the actual web page that I've been showing. You. So I guess you're going to circulate uh, the slides, and so any any of the users, anybody watching this uh, presentation, um, I'd encourage them to look at uh, the website. Uh, look at the report and uh, if they're so if they're interested to actually download the data and, and check out the data as well okay thank you very much uh, uh let me ask you uh something uh if i understand correctly in this study of yours there are not all eu countries included right that's correct um and the we reason limited behind our it, since uh, you said analysis that... to the nine nine of the larger members uh, where the where we actually had access in the labor force survey data uh, to a regional identifier. So in, in many of the smaller member states, uh, the nuts regions classification isn't really very, very, it doesn't differentiate very much between regions. In, in Ireland, for example, the country where I am, uh, there are just two nuts regions. In all of the region, in all of the countries that we selected for inclusion in this report, there's actually uh, a multiplicity of regions that we could actually cover using the labor force survey data. Uh, so that was partly informed our decision just to look at uh, uh, the regions uh, in the larger countries. Also, in the end, we didn't want to have uh, um, we didn't want to have to deal with uh, two hundred and eighty or three hundred different uh, regional observations. We just thought the whole analysis would become intractable. So we thought that um, with one hundred and thirty regions, we can just about uh, uh, we can just about present the data in a meaningful way, um, both online and in, in a report. Thank you very much. But that means that the data for the rest of, you know, for the smaller member states, they are available also on Eurostat, no? It means that uh, in principle, um, if anybody want to uh, replicate the analysis using the, uh, using the, the, the statistical set, processing that we actually carried out, uh, I would, of course, be happy to allow them do that. Um, but as I said, I'm not sure that it makes a whole lot of sense to, to apply this analysis to all of the, well, you could do it. Um, we would certainly uh, assist any uh, users in doing that by providing the relevant uh, uh, statistical uh, syntax and do files. Um, but we haven't done the analysis ourselves. We limited ourselves to these nine countries. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much So for, for the presentation. Now is European Patent Office. Martin Kracker, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Inma. Uh, uh, just one moment. I'm changing the presentation. Great, we can see it. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, yep. One moment. Uh, okay, I'm not sure whether you can see it now or not. Now we can see it. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, good afternoon from Vienna. Uh, my name is Martin Kraker from the European Patent Office. And I will give a very short presentation about what are patents and what is patent information. And then I will present two data sets which complement each other. One is EP full text data for tactics. It's text, it's a lot of text. And the other one is about structured data in a special format in linked format, linked open EP data. So let's start. What is a patent? A patent can be actually seen as a contract between the inventor who had a new idea and society. So society represented by the patent office gives the inventor the patent applicant 
and right to exclusively use and sell and produce the the invention but on the other side it's the obligation of the inventor to tell society how it is done so another one can have a, another invention based on his one uh, his invention so and this is done the second step is done via the means of patent information so the patent offices also the european patent offices is publishing uh, application and the idea behind it what you see here on what you will see here on the first uh, that's quite a delay actually what you will see here it's the first page of a patent patent document which contains what we call the bibliographic data it's the structure data which gives an overview of the patent so the title of the invention the abstract uh, the uh, the various dates when it has been uh, filed for an application when it has been published uh, the technical classifications uh, like in which area of the technology is it there's a very detailed technical classification which i will explain later the links to former patent applications or related patent applications which represent the same idea but which have been filed in different countries these are forming families uh, their citations then can be based on another patent or can be based or can refer to some scientific literature. Uh, that's what we call bibliographic data. And on the following pages, there's a, the text and drawings and claims describing the background of the invention uh, and, al and also what exactly is the new part which is claimed, and that's the name of claims, uh, which is claimed to be new and which or where the inventor then gets a monopoly on that. Uh, EP patent publications, uh, it might be a little bit complicated, so that's where the, some links to, to uh, to, to more in, uh, background information, web-based, and uh, also an e-learning course. Actually, each patent application is published uh, at least once, yeah, and or if it's granted, at least. So you have to know that between the filing of a patent and the first publications, there will be a there is always a delay of eighteen months. Uh, and then these publications are called A publications after the 18 months. It's either an A1 or an A2 publication. Details, please see the links above. If it's granted, there will be a B publication and that usually takes place then again one, two, three years later. Uh, the European Patent Office publishes patent information in all kinds of, of formats. You will see some human access. So these are online tools uh, which are focusing all on different aspects and some are for the beginners and some are for the more advanced patent user. What I recommend here is a tool called the SPASNET, which is really a tool which, which, uh, where you can easily see the first patent and, and do some very simple searches. It's easy to use and that's my first recommendation. We also have tools, uh, web services for machine to machine communication, and we also have data products. And I will talk about two data products, link data and that text uh, based product, which brings me to the first one. It's called EP full text data for text analytics. Um, I see there's a quite a delay between when I put it on screen and when you see it. I'm not sure whether you... St we cannot see anything now, it's in black, the screen. Yeah, it's... But maybe you can uh, leave the presenter view and uh, just go through the slides. Ah, now, uh, it, now we now are... Now it works, now it works. Okay. Blah, like this is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Okay. Yeah, yeah. I... Okay, so... Yeah, we leave it like this. Um, so some about these 
product I'm talking about, it's actually containing the titles, the, the abstract and the descriptions and the claims of each public, each uh, patent application since which have been filed since number one, which was 40 years ago at the European Patent Office. It's designed for really to, to easy to use to immediately be usable without much data preparation for people who are used in managing large amounts of text to doing machine learning, AI, linguistic research. It's an open license do inside or outside of the data thon, whatever you want. And we plan to have an update of that uh, actually next week. So I'm changing uh, yeah, the screen has been changed. So how does it look like? Actually, it's uh, it's a tab separated value file. So every line contains one specific aspect of a patent. A patent is in, uh, is identified by well by the office, which is EP for European Patent, by the publication number. And what you see here, we are all of the in the same patent. It has a certain publication kind. So it's all what we see here are about eight, nine, ten lines of a, of the same publication published on a certain date. And every uh, and it has various uh, parts. So the type three lines is available in German, English and French. We always have titles in three languages. And then we got the abstract. That's a one paragraph description of the uh, uh, global description. Then the, the description itself, which might be three pages, which might be 100 pages, uh, then the claims and then, sp then some specific parts which are not so much of interest. All that text is XML tag. So you'll see what is a Whereas an, 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 uh, a heading, a subheading, a paragraph beginning, uh, even some, some tables and mathematical formulas are sometimes represented as XML. Uh, about the data format, volume and access, actually it's a set of only 36 files, but in total it's 200 gigabyte. Uh, Every file of the 36 contains a range of 100,000 publication numbers. So the first file, number 1 to 99,999. Uh, uh, how to get access to it? It's a huge amount of data. So we put it on Google Cloud platform. So if you have, if you register for Google Cloud, you can download it, but Google charges some some fee for downloading that amount of data. It's about $25. Uh, so how to use it? Uh, usually, uh, my assumption is you will not use the complete uh, uh, all of these currently six million publications coming from about three million uh, applications. So you will have a subset of a certain time period, of a certain technical area, of a certain uh, applicant. Uh, so that means you first, and that's the left part here you have to combine it with another data set containing this information. It's linked open data, linked open EP data we will discuss in a minute. And then defining the, or identifying the relevant publication numbers for you, then you would then retrieve it from the public, from the data set of all the publication text. And then you will analyze it with whatever tool you need to. That brings me to the next uh, product. It's linked open EP data. Uh, what is it? It's actually a data product which contains for all EP publications, the bibliographic data. So the structure data we've seen on the first page, plus the CPC scheme. The CPC scheme is a, is a technical classification, which is which is very detailed and which is based in a hierarchy. We'll see it on the next slide. Um, it's, a for, it's a very special format called linked data. It's also a uh, semantic web or RDF, resource description framework. It's based on a worldwide web rec uh, recommendation, uh, which is, has been defined 10 years ago 
uh, it's not by far not as popular as CSV files or XML files, but it makes it very easy, as it's, the name says, to link various independently created data sets. And that's what actually the challenge is all about. It has to, we, the task is to combine different data sets. Uh, that one is, that data set is updated weekly and the target group is actually web developers, data scientists who are used to work with that kind of data, that amount of data. So it's rather something for the techies. Nevertheless, don't, don't go away because it's, the content is still interesting. Uh, so CPC as a pattern classification taxonomy that currently the EPO is using two classification systems, the older IPC and the more detailed but compatible CPC. What is it good for? Let's assume in the first row you have inventions. Uh, actually, the invention is very similar, but every, every applicant called it differently. One called it bottle opener, the other called it cork lifter. Nevertheless, it's the same thing. And to be able to retrieve it properly, it gets the same code. That's the same classification code of the CPC, which is in our case B67, B7. On the lower row, you will see two inventions which I give them the same name. It's both called lift arrangement, but definitely it's something different. So the pattern classification helps you to easily differentiate these two inventions because they have a totally different code. So that's the purpose of pattern classification code. These codes, you can easily define certain areas of the technology domain which are of interest to you. It also can help you to define green patterns as we will see later because everything which is related to, to climate mitigation technology has got a special code. Let's get a more tangible example. The CPC symbol, it's a hierarchy of, two, of a quarter of a million nodes or symbols and the hierarchy is like that. So the first, uh, the top level, it's called A, so it's human necessity. C might be chemistry and E is electronic. Uh, and then if you go further down, it gets more and more detailed and you see it can be really very detailed till you end up with a bread toaster with automatic ejection or timing means with mechanical clockwork timers. So the complete technical domain is covered by CPC that has been done by examiners to be effective, to effectively find the right patterns. And that of course helps you to identify the publications of your interest. Now let's go to linked data. First, a uh, very short introduction of what is linked data because it has a certain technical meaning. And the idea behind linked data is that you, you're thinking about your business object of, of your domain. We're talking about patents and publications. So our business object is a publication, an inventor, a CPC code, a patent office. And all these things get an identifier and the identifier is something globally unique and actually that's the basic idea. It looks like a URL. Technically it's slightly different but it can be used as a URL and for example here for a patent application we see an example in the gray box. It's the data epo.org because the EPO office gave it that identifier it's linked data, it's an identifier of an application, of an EP application of a certain number. And the interesting thing is that if you have that identifier and you put it anywhere in any browser, it gives you some useful information about that application. So it will tell you that application had an applicant of that name, it had been filed at a certain date, it has been filed at the European Patent Office, it has a certain number. So you can, and it also refers to other business objects which are related to that application. One way to, to visualize it is, is as a chart. I'm trying to switch screen, yes. Okay, you could see it as a huge network where every bubble is now a business object. Let's look middle side. For example, we have an EP publication. An EP publication, oh, sorry, application has a publication. 
uh, both has been processed or uh, uh, published by some by some office. A publication cites another publication because it's based on that idea, or it cites a non uh, uh, or it's some scientific literature. A publication contains the information that it has an inventor. That inventor, John Smith, here he, he's he's actual inventor of two publications. Publications are classified by IPC or CPC. Applications are grouped together by families if that uh, application is actually the same idea but applied in different countries because you, also, you only get a patent on a country level. So that's a huge network and you also on the right side, you patent application can refer to some, some item outside of our data set. That's what the linking is. What you see here, key our application, that's a Korean application. The Korean published their data set, the Korean patent office. So and we can say, well, our patent, the European patent is related to the Korean patent with the same technology. So it can be seen as a graph. So what is the purpose of that? Uh, sorry, uh, you could What's the business value? You could say if an application has many members, so it belongs to a large family, that means that the applicants, the owner of the patent, invested a lot of money to get it granted in many countries. That costs him some money, so he believes the patent has some worth. Or you can see that's his market. If he files it in Germany, in France, and in UK, you know that he has a European market and he's not interested in China. You can see technology trends. You can see how many patents are filed for a certain, in a certain technological field and how does it develop over time. You will see 3D printing is something which was almost non-existent 10 years ago. Now it's on the rise. Uh, you, can, you can look at citations like you follow up uh, scientific citations. If a, if a paper, a patent is cited a lot, it's obviously important. That means it has a higher value. You can look at persons. You can see uh, that John Smith obviously filed two patents. Probably he filed more. So it's an interesting person uh, who is as, as good. He's probably well known in that technical domain. We saw Cordis before. Uh, Cordis contains organization which are funded by the European Union. One can see whether these organizations also fund We've seen it's mostly universities. Universities are also uh, filing patents here. You could see the authors of the, of the publications in Cordis. They probably have been cited here or they cite another patent. So there are connections, just giving you some ideas what you can do. Uh, so there's a page on our homepage it is here on blue, epo.org slash link data. That's a starting point where you'll find all information on the bottom of the page. There's a user guide, there's sample queries and all that stuff. And I will go through the application now very quickly. Uh, you have here the main menu, which says API Spark query documentation. In that browse application, if you enter a one of these IDs we saw before, you will get that information. So here we entered the HTTP data.ebu.org something. You see the abstract, you see a human readable label, you see the publication date, uh, you see the publication number, you see the title, German, English and French and so on. So that's a visualization so you can explore what you see, but actually what you can get is the data behind it. Uh, you also can uh, parameterize these APIs so you can filter, sort, and ask for certain formats like ch JSON or, or X um, CSV formats at the output. Most interesting is you can define queries. Uh, link data is, is retrieved by Sparkle queries, which are actually uh, it's a, also a World Wide Web recommendation. It's, it's a huge power. You can count, you can group, you can create creations, uh, you can uh, relationships between various data sets locally and uh, in other data. 
Uh, I will give you a short example afterwards, but that's really a powerful way to search in your, and to, to reformat and to, to adapt your data. Nevertheless, what I've shown you in the last three, four slides, what you really get is data and that data, uh, oh, you're lag lagging behind in your presentation. Anyway, you can download the data uh, as, and import it into your own, your own triple store. That's what is called the database for linked open data. Uh, so it's freely available. Just about the size, it's 60 gigabyte and 650 million triples. Triples are what we call the atomic information item. Hello? Hello? One, two, three. Am yes. I back again? We can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so what is the benefit of all of that? It's definitely not for the one who is used to work with Excel sheets. But for data scientists, web developers, it's a really powerful, rich data set. It's a very simple format. As I mentioned, it's triples. Uh, you can combine it with other data sets. It's standard. It's not, nothing the EPU invented. It's, uh, it's based on, on the infrastructure which exists, and that's the internet. So the purpose of all this linked data, it's combining, it should it will and does make combining data sets easier. So because just imagine taking a CSV file and an XML file, it's a pain to combine that. With linked data, it's easier. Just uh, some ideas what you could do by combining pattern data with other data. You could combine it with court decisions on the left side. It's uh, ECLI, that's a European case law identifier defined by the European Union. You can combine it with dictionaries and encyclopedias. There's one famous, which is called DBpedia, which is the, the link data version of Wikipedia. And I will mention it in three minutes again. Uh, you can combine it to academic journals, to annual reports, uh, to trademark data of the IP, uh, of the European uh, IP office in Alicante. So there's uh, lots of possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually the link data cloud that there's a website, the lower left. Uh, corner, which visualizes all available data sets which are currently there and which how they are combined. So you see the many data sets available, of course, of different uh, of linked op linked data sets available, uh, of course, of different quality and size. Uh, so what can you do with it? Uh, to show a real example, we created a small web application, EPO, LOD, so EPO, linkedopendata.org. You can try it. It's really sm very simple. Uh, to, where we combined our EP linked open data set, we just talked about with DBpedia. S so that's actually uh, all done on the fly. It's no data is held. It can give you some idea some more ideas what you could do, of course, combining environmental data, green patterns and green patterns are classified as YO2. I'll give you an example on the next slide. Code is I mentioned, you can combine with scientific literature, Springer Nature Publishing House published their uh, bibliographic data as linked open data as to my knowledge for free. And of course, analysis visualization of such rich graphs, it's always a challenge. Uh, I mentioned Y02. That's again, that's another concrete example of the CPC. There's actually a browser for it. So uh, uh, it's hosted by the EPO. And you can see here the hierarchy. Y is a cross functional uh, classification, Y02 is technologies for mitigation or adaption against climate change. 
and then the level above is wired to A, B, C, D, E, and so on, which are special parts of the wire to E. It's a reduction of greenhouse gas related to energy generation. And if you go further down, so YO2E1 or 10, it's, I think it's solar energy or earth term, uh, further down earth thermal energy or wind energy or uh, energy created by the sea. Uh, that's quite detailed stuff where you can identify specific technologies which are um, uh, used uh, by certain uh, patent publications. And here's an example of a Sparkle query, which retrieves application, which are classified as YO2. Very quickly, let's go through the first part. Actually, that's technical stuff. We forget it. What you will see here, it's the query on the right bottom corner, the output. So you will see all applications. That's the first column here in the, sorry, the first column here, all applications which are a pattern classification and which are, have an, I'm struggling with my mouse, uh, which are classified by CPC and have a certain readable label which, uh, that you will find here in the second column. And we filter it. It says this CPC must start with YO2. So that's why all the CPC entries we see on the second column of the table start with YO2, like D10 or E10 or whatever. And then we also output from that application the publication and from the publication the title and that we'll see on the third and right column of the table. So I think six lines, you get applications which contain way more information, but we only see the CPC symbol they're classified with and the title. And of course you can retrieve now the application number and, and go on with your analysis. So there are lists of lot of resources. That's my last slide, I'll leave it here. You can make a screenshot. Uh, just want to mention, general, there's a lot of information about patents. Patents, it's not easy to understand, but we got discussion forums, we got a help desk, linked open data, we have a webinar, a one hour webinar next week, yeah. or you can see a recording of the next week's webinar or from an elderly seminar, we got documentation, it's all actually here or the, the references and the pointers on this page. So, and that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, thank you very much, Martin, for your presentation. So, uh, I would have a, pr a question. For example, you mentioned we could also link it to Cordis, and I think that would be quite handy. How would you propose to do that? or? Uh, where can we find uh, similar things to, to link the patents to the projects? I know I don't know Cordis well enough, but I've seen the content of it. So, uh, I, I mean, it looks like there's an overlap between what you call a project partner organization and an applicant. Because our applicants are universities, larger companies, smaller companies, and and uh, that sounds similar to your side. Or an author of a of a Cordis project publication, he might also be an author of a scientific publication which are cited by our patents. Oh. Nice. Um, uh, also, of course, the technical domain. Uh, you have some technical sub. I don't know, Horizon 2020 was that you got some subgrouping of that. And if you say, well, it's about, I don't know, electronic mobility, then you will have to look up what are the CPC codes for electronic mobility, and then you will find the corresponding patterns. But of course, you have to think there's a delay of 18 months before it gets published. So um, for Horizon 2020, where the will be more or less coming now. And if somebody files a pattern now, it will not be visible before 2022. 
Well, if I may to comment on that, is we have information about the patents, but they are currently not in the EU Open Data Portal. We are working on it, but I didn't mention it because I don't think it will be in coming weeks. But I think in the second part of the year, the the, the patents list with the IDs, which could be linked to the uh, European Patent Office, will be available. That would be great, yes. Yeah, super, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, would you recommend some, uh, because you know your classification system, would you recommend some categories that would be pertinent to Challenge 2 in a way that categories you have already mentioned, classification is pertinent to Green Deal, let's say? Uh, yeah, everything which is categorized by one or two, 102 or a subsection of 102. I mean, uh, I'm. This going would back. be for the Green Deal, right? Yeah, for the Green Deal. Oh, sorry, for the second one for economy. Uh, for I the mean, second one. Patent pat yeah, sorry, I mix it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, patent information actually contains technical information and also uh, economic mm -hmm. information that CPC identifies the technical part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you rather have to look in which companies have been filing patents, so you probably have to go via the company level. Okay, thank you for the insight. Yeah. So, well, you thank, thank you very much, Martin, again. So then just to close this uh, second webinar, uh, you will be the Director General for U Regional and Urban Policy. So, John Walsh, the floor is yours. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. We see, can see you. Yes, yes. And we can, can see you and hear you. Screen. Yeah, it works perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for uh, this this opportunity. My name is John Welsh. I'm here with uh, uh, Jose Pinto from our communication unit. We'd like to talk a little bit about um, the structural in and investment open data platform. Uh, in particular, uh, the ERDF and uh, uh, regional development funding and social funding which represents about one third of the European budget. So uh, then with our colleagues from Horizon, we, we represent close to half of the European budget. Um, on the open data platform, this is the home page. I just want to point out a number of things. The data catalog is accessible. Um, the data we're going to show you is unique data in the sense that only we, DG Employment, DG colleagues, have this data uh, which we're sharing through the platform um, it's very complementary to the data that we saw uh, to a large extent from Eurostat uh, some of our data is available at regional level um, and I'll also show you uh, some how, how, how it appeals to the challenges so the Green Deal challenge and the economic uh, and economy working for people and the digital challenge. But first, let me just show for those people interested in the data, when you go to the data catalog, uh, when you click on that button, it actually pre filters to the data sets. And here you see the metadata tables. And you see that these first data sets here uh, are all about financing. Uh, you see data sets on the current programming period on the planned financing, which has thematic details in it that I'll show you in a minute. Implementation of that investment. So these are just the plans in this data set. Here you see how the, the money is flowing. Is it, is it, has it been allocated uh, to specific projects? Uh, and how are those projects progressing? Are they spending the money? Here you see about the actual EU payments made by program. This third data set doesn't have much thematic information in it, so I won't dwell on that. Um, the fifth data set on the list is the achievement details. And here you find information about the volume of CO2 emissions that are hope hopefully going to be reduced. 
uh, other energy, uh, renewable energy capacities being financed, uh, energy savings being, fin being financed. And then the other data set that I really want to spend a bit more time on is actually much more detailed. Um, so this is a financial data set. Click on it, you see we're now on the metadata page for this data set. It gives you a description. So you find a bit of a description with some reference documents, okay. It also shows you some user, user statistics. And to be honest, uh, this is the biggest data set we have. And that may explain why it's relatively underused uh, so far. People have not really discovered it. But uh, here you see a sample of the data set. You see that it's, it's relatively wide, but it is an extremely long data set. And it's, so it's, it's the most disaggregated data set we have on the finances uh, by uh, themes. What you can do with this um, is uh, you can download it in various formats, but I'm not going to show you this. You can also, it's API, you can, you can get API uh, tokens, you can link to it, you can make all data connections, and there's also documentation on Soda. So you can, if you, if you want to use Soda queries, uh, you, can, you can do that. What I'm going to do now is jump to the slides, which are just here, bear with me. And uh, I want to talk a little bit and answer the questions that our colleagues in the, the Open Data Portal asked us. So the categorization data set covers uh, 350 programs, many of them regional. It provides the total cost and the EU share of investments for 123 detailed investment themes. So thinking about the Green Deal, thinking about sustainable energy, there are specific codes for solar energy. Uh, so we're tracking the investments in, in wind energy, in biomass, uh, in energy efficiency in buildings, energy efficiency in SMEs. So we have quite, quite detailed thematic information in there. I'll show you some of the things we've been able to do with it. Here's the link to the specific uh, data sets that might be of most interest. And this third one here is the most detailed. It's that big data set we were just looking at. Why is it important? Uh, well, you could compare this data uh, on the total investment and the scale of the EU involvement. You could compare it to uh, perhaps some of the Eurostat statistics or other information from uh, the budgets in the member states to look at uh, our contribution to public investment in some of these areas. Um, it has information on the planned and then the executed investments. Reveal, well, one thing it certainly shows is progress uh, over time. It's annualized, so you can see both where there are delays and where there is already very quick implementation of some of the investments. Um, we also provide a, a reference table, a crop, what we call a lookup table, to allow you to map the programs to NUTS regions, so potentially combining some of this information with information from Eurostat. The, I said at the beginning, the data is unique in that we collect it from many, many programs, 350 programs. Uh, they report annually on the progress. We provide it in annual time series. Uh, another interesting thing you can do with the data is look at how investment plans change over time. So it's sometimes it can be quite dynamic. Uh, what could be improved? Well, what could, what sort of people bring. The data itself is quite complicated. I'm going to finish with one of the visualization tools we have developed, but there are many other things that could be done. Uh, for instance, using Eurostat data on population by region, you could compare the volume of EU investment on Green Deal themes per capita. So you could take our, our money look at the population and see where is the more intense investments taking place. We don't do this. 
So you, that would be something new. You could go thematic, you could look at sustainable energy, you could look at risk prevention, you could look at uh, um, investments in social, th uh, social themes as well from the social fund, um, and do uh, particular apps, particular visualizations, and explore uh, that and link that to social data uh, from Eurostat. Uh, the potential audience we already have of uh, many different specialized stakeholders. But what I'd like to do, how do I get back to that? Bear with me. Okay. What I'd like to do is to go back to the platform to show you some of the things we have done. Not there. Okay, here we go. So if you go uh, using that detailed categorization data, if you go to the Regional Development Fund page, We've recently added this chart, a Sankey chart, where we explore the member states' investments in the low carbon economy. I'm going to try and expand that a bit, bear with me. Okay. So the member states in the low carbon economy, which is a high level theme, one of the Green Deal themes. Uh, you can see here that we have others environment in the in the menu above we also have uh climate action it must be higher up climate change action low carbon economy and then you see the detailed themes over here so this is as far as we have got so far in presenting what types of investments take place under the low carbon economy but look you can check the progress in delivering that investment this is the way we like to present it. You could also look at it as there are still investment opportunities. There's still money that has not yet been allocated. Um, so in that case, around 25% of the money for energy efficiency in public, uh, public infrastructure has not yet been allocated. Using the data, you could explore. If I click on this, we've, it's a nice little tool. We can focus in on this energy efficiency in buildings, public buildings. We can see the average rate. Take it back to the member states. OK, so we can also filter on this side. So this is one little tool we've developed. Um, and if you want to see the full complexity of it, it looks like this. Um, the last point I would make uh this this is run here's the link to that data set as well you see it just under the title uh, so the data set as we said is open it's api driven the last point i would like to make let me go back to the uh to the top of this page is you can also explore some of the stories that we have been able to put together for instance, uh, in the area of green growth, climate tracking, uh, more than 20% of cohesion policy is allocated to climate tracking. These stories are built on top of the data sets and it's our attempt to explain the total volume that is, that is being invested. This is the project pipeline, okay? And this is the actual spending compared to the plan. So here you can see that the data is annualized. Here you see the fund overviews, and then here you see the detailed themes that are counted against climate tracking. So we're very transparent about this. Uh, and this is all driven. You can drill back into the data set that's driving all of this. This is just one example of what we've been able to do, but we hope that some of the developers out there will be able to explore this data, perhaps contextualize it with Eurostat, uh, in the area of the Green Deal. I focused on the Green Deal, but of course we have other themes as well. Uh, if I go back and then I'll finish on that, if I go back to the home page, you see that we also have, uh, to have other themes such as digital, okay? That's also in the categorization. We also have uh, DG employment and DG, uh, our, our, our investments in uh, social inclusion, labor market, and skills. So there's a lot more information in there that I haven't been able to develop. If you have questions, we're delighted to help. Okay.
point. Okay, thank you very much, John, for your presentation. Well, so this is the end of the webinar too. Thank you all the speakers for contributing. So uh, to Eurostat, Director General for Research and Innovation, Eurofund, European Patent Office, and Director General for Regional and Urban Policy. I hope that uh, this webinar was useful for you. And uh, we invite you to link the different uh, resources that uh, the speakers presented here for submitting your, your proposal. And uh, we really hope it is going to help as well to tackle the different challenges. Um, don't forget to submit uh, your proposal by the 3rd of May. And if you have further questions, uh, just don't hesitate to contact us through our functional mailbox. Um, when again, once again, thank you very much for joining. And uh, this webinar will be very soon available in the website. So you can like uh, see it again if you need it. And I'll see you uh, in the next webinar. We have two different webinars next week. We have one on Thursday and another one on Friday. So for further information about who is presenting and for which challenge, we invite you to go to the website to uh, have an overview about what's happening. But uh, yes, thank you again, everyone. Have a nice day and weekend.